welcome RTM members and members of the public here in Town Hall and quite a few people attending by Zoom. Most of you know Fred and me, but for those who don't, I'm Mary Hegarty, the Greenwich's Democratic Registrar of Voters, and this is Fred DeCaro, Greenwich's Republican Registrar of Voters. By law, every town in Connecticut has a Democratic Registrar and a Republican Registrar, which works well to ensure elections are run in a nonpartisan way, and which should help to give voters confidence that election administration is conducted untainted by politics. Fred and I work together to provide the voters of Greenwich with safe, secure, and accessible elections. We are proud to model nonpartisan civility in this process. Before we get to the meat of the presentation, I will outline how we will proceed. Tonight's presentation about administering elections and best practices in a polarized environment is in lieu of the registrars taking additional time at individual RTM district and committee meetings before the March 13th RTM meeting to discuss election administration grants. We met for more than 15 hours with various RTM committees and districts before the January RTM meeting. We answered questions in person and through two Q&As distributed to all RTM members. We listened and responded to RTM members' questions. We worked to correct misrepresentations of fact and mischaracterizations of the registrar's points of view. This presentation will not be an opportunity to revisit the January marathon. In January, we listened for hours ex as folks made statements, assertions, accusations, and speculations. Everything we say tonight will have a reference, a picture, a link, or testimony. The presentation will be based on facts and our own firsthand observations. We have a substantial presentation and we have guests from around the nation taking time from their schedules to be with us this evening. Questions from the floor will not be addressed tonight. If RTM members have additional questions we did not address before the January RTM meeting or which are not answered in our presentation tonight, please email both of us. You can use the contact, contact us link on our website or simply email vote at greenwichct.org. We will answer in writing in a Q&A which we will mail to the whole RTM membership. In this way, those watching on Zoom and those who will watch the later recording on Greenwich's YouTube channel will be on an equal footing with the people here in person. What is tonight about? Tonight, this is a presentation by the registrars to illustrate the value of sharing best practices in election administration. We have guest presenters from other jurisdictions who will share their wisdom. After the body of our presentation, we will briefly respond with facts to recent widely disseminated communications which veer from fact into fiction. Finally, we will make an announcement about a new election program which we believe may be of interest to some of you. As Greenwich's chief election officials, we believe it is incumbent on us to constantly strive to innovate and improve election administration in Greenwich. Good is not good enough for us. This is what this is all about. With that, I will turn it over to Fred. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'll speak into the... Am I speaking into it enough now? Okay, very good. Uh, so, to go over today's agenda, which is a lengthy one, we'll be talking a little bit about election administration in general as a government entity, where good ideas come from, our experience in the first month of being a center of excellence and interacting with our peers, and the kind of sharing that goes on at Alliance events. We'll hear from one of the advisory board members of the Center of Technology and Civic Life, Ricky Hatch, who is the uh, County Clerk of the Year 
in Colorado for 2022. We'll address some statements made in the media uh, related to different facts. We'll talk about alliance partners and coaching because there's been questions about what exactly does coaching mean uh, when uh, we work with alliance partners? And we'll have an example of that. We'll have a board member of the Center of Technology and Civic Life and the most recent Republican nominee for the Secretary of State in Colorado, Pam Anderson, address us. And then we'll announce our new program. So, Mary and I take classes all of the time. They could be short webinars or they could be longer classes, college level classes. Um, uh, I'm currently taking a class from the um, Election Center, the, uh, the National Association of Election Officials, the clearinghouse basically for elections. And the next three slides come from uh, their program on leadership and management. And uh, I, I think in, in some ways it summarizes what election officials feel in general and also uh, a lot of government employees uh, when they wind up um, sort of uh, you know, taking on a, a position. Um, you, you face challenges which oftentimes are bigger than what your small office is, is, is thought of if you were in a, a small company. You don't necessarily have the kind of client appreciation associated with it. You definitely get increased public interest, but the most positive and rewarding side is what we call mission loyalty, which is that you develop a passion for what you're doing and doing it well and always wanting to continue to improve related to that. Now, I think everyone would agree, and this is the sentiment in our field across the nation, that public service can have a PR problem. There's declining trust in government, and I would focus on the concept of a, a split personality. We see oftentimes that folks say, um, Congress is a low rating, but their congressman is okay, or you're doing a good job, or we're doing a good job, but we don't know about those other folks you're working with. And the complex nature of what we deal with doesn't lend itself to sound bites. Explaining, for instance, how a, the wrong ballot is given out in a, in a community, as happened in uh, Stratford a few years ago, isn't a, sort of an easy process. So what working election, in election administration means to us is that you have a variable and cyclical workload. Um, and it can mean going from a low point of 10 or 12 hours a week to uh, an in incredibly engaging time, which can be far more than 40 hours. And looking at the proposals for early voting, we're scratching our heads figuring out how exactly we're going to make some of that work. You sometimes have very highly emotional clients that you need to deal with. People get very excited about elections. Your clients have various needs, whether they be candidates or they be voters or they be the general public. And you have to deal with all of those concerns in a, in a fair and nonpartisan way. You have to have skills and you have to build in working with volunteers. And you have to be very careful in the way in which you interact with the public because no matter what kind of aspersions may be cast against a particular project or a person, you have a duty to serve. And in particular, there's very little tolerance for error. So even when we have a recount of 15,000 ballots, as we did in the recent um, uh, state Senate election, which is a 99.93% accuracy rate, we still strive to do better. Now, what we're going to talk about here is how we go and we search for good ideas to continue to improve that process. And how actually we've been doing that using newsletters and we'll show you things we've implemented coming from actually the Center for Technology and Civic Life going back half a decade. So we've taken a whole series of cybersecurity classes that have been offered through the center in conjunction with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That is the clearinghouse related to this information. In fact, it is the set of standards by which the town of Greenwich's own cybersecurity program is graded using those NIST standards. A few years ago, we saw 
um, in their newsletter a spotlight on Arlington County, Virginia, and what they're doing to train their poll workers. And one of the things they talked about was online training. And you can see, this may be hard to see, but you'll see copies of this. Mary and I immediately gravitated to this. How can we work on this? What can we do given the disparate skill sets to put this in? And we began to think about it. And in fact, were we to get the grant, it was one of the highest priority items on our list. We go and we've researched post-election audits, which are a unique kind of audit, different than what we have in, in the state of Connecticut, which is just a random selection. Post-election audits are the next wave of audits, which haven't yet been uh, implemented here. And what they do is they use greater statistical certainty, and you keep on counting until you get to a level of confidence, okay, in order to ensure things. It's not simply a random process. A few years ago, and again, all of these come from the Center of Technology and Civic Life newsletters. We found a, a spotlight on Cumberland County, New Jersey, and a turnout trophy that they do to encourage turnout in their local elections. And Mary and I embraced that. We said, we can do this with our 12 RTM districts. We can create the Town of Greenwich turnout trophy. And in fact, that's exactly what we did. And when we do our poll worker appreciation day, there are some of our poll workers celebrating in that year, District 5 actually won with the highest turnout. District 5's won a few years, actually. This is a spotlight on Bristol, Connecticut. Now, even though they're in here in Connecticut, and I know those registrars, and Mary does, we did not know that they were using their polling places to do food drives. And so you may remember that in 2020, right before COVID hit, we piloted one of those in the special election in the 151st. And we used neighbor to neighbor. And neighbor to neighbor said that the, the support from it was fantastic, that they averaged eight crates per location, 24 crates of food. And they asked if we could go and we could expand that program. Of course, COVID hit, and we haven't had that same opportunity. But these are the kind of things that we're talking about when we look at how we are collaborating with others. It's not a matter of sharing voter data. It's a matter of looking at best practices and other things that are going to innovate and help both the community and the practice of election administration. So what happens when centers of excellence meet? Mary and I have had the opportunity to go to both a, an in-person conference now and a virtual conference. So the first thing I wanted to show is first impressions. Okay, the centers of excellence were asked what the key words were, the values were that they wanted to put it, not the Center for Technology, but what the centers of excellence, what's most important to them. And if you look at the top six words here, okay, they're things we should all be embracing, transparency, trust, security, accessibility, accuracy, and integrity. These are the things that election administrators focus on, okay? If you look at the larger list of values and the things that people put, we talk about voter-centric behavior, continuing to maintain public trust in elections, and effective election administration. And Mary and I may not agree on everything on that list, but we sure do agree with a lot of them. We talked about the first three topics that the centers wanted to tackle, and this was based upon individual interviews, those visits when people came here, and what it was centers were interested and in where they felt they had either needs or good processes they wanted to share. And the first topic that we're tackling is poll worker recruitment, training, management, and retention something that we have been talking about for years. The second is establishing trust through communication, something in this environment which is so important when election integrity is on everyone's mind. And the third is actually physical security. Cybersecurity will come at a later date. But what's so important, and we've talked about it, is chain of custody and ballot accounting and auditing 
And as the state decides what it's going to do for early voting, we're, we're excited that we're going to be able to look and see how numerous states and other places are handling those challenges so we can bring those best practices back to Connecticut, not just to Greenwich, but to the state. I want to show you a little bit about what was shared at the conference, okay? Because again, it, it, it wasn't a matter of again, sharing voter data. It was a matter of sharing paraphernalia, communication documents, et cetera. This was, a, and, and everything here, I'm literally showing you everything that was brought back from the conference, okay? Everything that we chose to take with us. Paperwork and, and graphics associated with recruiting uh, young, more young people working at the polls. How to create better graphics to create more engaging materials so that people have, you know, more interest in some of the uh, sort of lesser but more important things related to, to an election. Oops. Educating voters on security. This is a flyer put together by a consortium of all of the counties in the Bay Area of California. It is entirely nonpartisan. It talks about how you secure networks, how you secure facilities, how you secure your processes, and how you secure your people. And it was done in, in conjunction with the Center for Internet Security. This is a sample of how you can communicate voter ID requirements, an excellent document that we loved from DeKalb County, Georgia. Samples of, of uh, voter and uh, poll worker and observer recognition ideas. Some of these are from Contra Costa County, California, uh, Clark County, Nevada, uh, Forsyth County, North Carolina, around the country, how people are just doing little things to motivate their poll workers. You can't go to a conference without voter appreciate, voter I voted stickers. Looking at those from around the country, what it is that people use. And one of my favorites actually from the Center for Civic Design was field guides, as they call them, on how to write better materials for your voters to guide them through the polling place, to write more effective instructions, okay? How to create more effective poll worker materials, how to it, design usable ballots, which is not something we do in Connecticut, but is done by other county clerks, okay? Creating forms that help voters. And what did we share? We didn't share data. What we shared was the surveys that we send out to our voters, okay, that we have done in the past to ask them how well we're doing when we're conducting an election. We shared a copy of the poll worker survey that we use um, so that we know that we're both uh, teaching and teaching our poll workers what they need to know, to know that they're satisfied with the folks that they're working with, that they're working in a safe environment, and, and people they want to recommend to come and work for us. So what do actual election administrators say about working with CTCL and the Alliance for Election Excellence? So I'm hoping that, Rick, yes, he has. Ricky Hatch has joined. I was just We're going to promote him. Okay. So while Ricky gets promoted to panelist, do you want to do his bio? Yes, yeah, so sure, absolutely, yes. They don't need to see the sleed. They don't need to see the slide. So we're going to stop your sharing screen. Well, that's cute. So could you please get back Ricky Hatch. So one of our panelists this evening is Ricky Hatch. Is my microphone working correctly? Yes, it is. And uh, Ricky, can you unmute yourself so we can hear you? Yes, how does this work? Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Ricky Hatch, who's county clerk and auditor, auditor in Weber County, Utah. Prior to being elected in 2010, Mr. Hatch worked as an information systems auditor and consultant. He is a member of the Department of Homeland Security's Election Infrastructure Government Coordinating Council, GCC, and chairs its communications working group. He serves on the board of advisor for the U.S. Election Assistance Commission the Center for Tech and Civic Life, and the Center for Civic Design. Mr. Hatch testified twice before Congress on election cybersecurity. 
He was honored as Utah's County Clerk of the Year in 2015 and again last year in 2022 and County Auditor of the Year 2013 and 2017. Welcome, Ricky. Thanks so much. Nice to be here. Can we, uh, Can we, uh, we don't need to spotlight that. Can we just hey. spotlight Ricky? Yeah. Yep, so now Ricky is just spotlighted. Uh, so, Ricky, uh, so, Ricky, you've had the pleasure of serving on the Center of Technology for Technology and Civic Life's Board of Advisors for quite a while here now. How many years? Uh, I first started in 2017, so about six years now. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the depth of involvement you have as a member of the Board of Advisors? Uh, Board of Advisors, generally we would meet with uh, the team with the CTCL about four times a year. Almost always those are phone calls. We've had a couple of in-person meetings, but uh, uh, so we just, they, they say, here's some of the projects we're working on. And then we, we provide them with suggestions and uh, ways to, to make it better and generally provide feedback. So I'm sure you have folks in your community who may question your involvement. You're in a state which has restricted the acceptance of grants. Why do you not simply step away and, and disengage? <laughs> well, because CTCL is a tremendous, great resource for me and my staff. And I, I really like the idea of making this resource better and more available for election officials across the country. Uh, they spotlighted something that uh, a piece of technology that we used to communicate with our poll workers by using Google Voice. So it was a free technology that any small county can do they spotlighted that and made it available, but they did it so much better than we could have done because they actually provided the tools and the suggestions on the step-by-step -step process on how to do that. To me, that was really valuable. And, uh, and so I wanted to share that. So, um, have you, in your five or six years, have you ever been asked for any data extracts or voter lists or other bulk data from the Center for Tech and CDCL? Uh, never. No, they asked for my opinion. That's about it. So, so have you ever heard of any plans for any kind of data collection? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any efforts to uh, collect data from election officials. We have our own channels to doing that, primarily through the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Uh, they they gather a lot of statistics, but CTCL, I don't think, has ever asked for that, or do they plan to? So, so you sit on the you sit on the Department of Homeland Security's Election Infrastructure Coordinating, Coordinating Council, as Mary mentioned. So, you're aware, you're aware of the physical and electronic threats to voting systems and databases. Is there anything about your work with the CPCL that gives you pause on this front? Uh, no, nothing at all. Uh, I would be worried if they had access to my systems or uh, influence over my systems, but they have zero. The only interaction I have with CTCL is through email and uh, telephone, and occasionally I'll see them uh, in person at a conference or something like that. But there's there's zero interaction beyond that. So um, um, I know uh, that you have, um, you're going to be testifying before the Utah State Legislature this evening, which is why we took you um, a little early in the, in the program. But for perspective, I know you've run for office as a Republican and you've been reelected several times. Can you tell me what was the percentage vote for presidential candidates in your jurisdiction in the 2020 election? Uh, in 2020, President Trump uh, received 59% of the votes in Weber County. Uh, we're a pretty red county. Um, and I, I grew up through the Republican Party. And uh, I, I had no intention of running for office, but uh, just wanted to serve in the party because I believed in the party platform so much. Um, and I was actually elected as part of the Tea Party movement um, and was a Tea Party candidate. So uh, yeah, we're still, still a very red county and uh, I'm still heavily involved in the party. So is there anything else about um, being a, a member of the Centers for Excellence and your experience that you just want to share with us in general? 
Well, I'm a huge fan of collaboration, and I, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. The thing that CTCL and that the Alliance does is they provide very practical um, suggestions and ideas. Rather than provide, they share really practical uh, suggestions that uh, I have used. Uh, some I have used, some I just I think are interesting, but I don't use them. And, and they're just uh, extremely helpful uh, technical uh, idea sharers. And I, I really appreciate that uh, from them. And they've been so careful when they've worked with us. So in Utah, the prohibition on grant money was uh, restricted last year. Um, before uh, And the way it's written, I, I technically could take grant money if I wanted uh, for certain activities, but I choose not to because I don't want to push, push the envelope at all. But um, uh, they, they're, whenever they've talked uh, to the board of advisors about uh, providing grants, we've always encouraged and they've always agreed these grants need to be as simple to apply for as possible, and they need to have virtually zero strings attached uh, other than a couple of reporting requirements. Uh, and they've, they've always felt strongly about that, that the, the strings attached need to be so minimal that people don't feel beholden to, uh, to that organization uh, for anything. Um, and that was really helpful. Only two counties in Utah accepted grants in 2020 from CTCL, and those were the two most conservative uh, counties in the state. So we, uh, we appreciated the availability of the funds, and I especially appreciate the willingness for CTCL to share uh, uh, very helpful uh, technical objective on the ground information and uh, skills and ideas with, uh, with election officials. So out of curiosity, what are you testifying on before the Utah State Legislature? Well, I lead the uh, the clerks county clerks association. I'm the legislative chair. Uh, there's a, a pretty sweeping elections related bill. We had a an elections audit um, performed last year by the legislative audit group. Uh, it was a great audit. It had some, um, it came out with no findings of no significant errors or problems, uh, but it did have recommendations, which we knew it would, and we we wanted it to because we won't always want to improve and. Uh, out of the result of that 130-page audit uh, came a 70-page bill that uh, provides some additional suggestions for improvement, so I'm testifying to that bill. All right. Ricky, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I know you've got an evening ahead of you now with uh, the Utah legislature, but thanks for, for calling in to us here in Connecticut. My pleasure. Appreciate you. Thank you. So we did take Ricky out of, um, out of order from the other speakers because he did need to get to the uh, Utah State Legislature. So we wanted to, because we did say uh, that there were definitely questions that uh, had come up during the uh, time after the first approval of the grant, um, and we wanted to uh, address some of those, including uh, an email that went out to all our TM members today, we've had an opportunity to look at it. So we wanted to prevent a few, present a few facts related to that. So first, we want to talk about how sometimes a lack of context can create an unnecessary alarm. Now, we've happily responded to multiple FOI requests. We've provided every email with the grantor, with any alliance partner, uh, going back to 2016. We've provided anything with certain terms in them. We've asked for, we've had over 700, 700 to 800 emails reviewed and distributed to various requesters. And this, this particular email came up, and we want to go through it point by point, because it was brought up in some fashion as being some sort of sharing, much like this, the, the data sharing, et cetera, that we're doing. And what are, these, what are these items? What are these terms in here? What's at the dungeon? So um, we're, gonna go we're just going to go through point by point, show you each of these items, and show you where exactly they're already published on our website, if you're interested in looking at them, as they have been for years. So what exactly is a tour of the dungeon? The dungeon is where we store our equipment in the basement. 
These are the keys I received when I took over in 2009 from my predecessor. And you can see that's exactly how they were labeled. It's where we keep the equipment. It's not a climate controlled environment. One of the first things that we wanted to do, should we get grant money, is add climate control to it because we do have electronic equipment down there. There's nothing secret in the dungeon. We're happy to give anyone a tour of the dungeon. What is the color pictures of the EIB? Well, all of you have seen it because we've passed it out. EIB is just an abbreviation for an election in a box. It's the blue bins that you see in all of the polling places. You've seen this picture. It's how we securely store and, and transport our materials between polling places. If you look in the upper left compartment, there are locked ballot bags that are sealed. They're sealed in an inner compartment that is also locked. And then the whole thing is again sealed and locked. Maps of polling places. Maps are actually one of the only things on this that we actually don't publish on our website for no particular reason. But we are always looking from other election professionals for how can we improve voter flow? What is our signage like? How can we make it clearer? What kind of clearer diagrams can we provide to our voters and to our poll workers and to the folks who set up the polling places? Sample checker books. I encourage anyone who has the hour, you can watch our official checker training. You can see every page of a checker book, instructions on how exactly you check off a voter, how you deal with a supplemental voter, how you deal with someone who's not in the book. There are no secrets here. These items are already on our website and have been for more than five years. The same thing with our electronic poll book, an hour long class showing you everything from booting it up to operating it to how to close it down. The moderator return. The moderator return is the document at the end of the evening where all of the um, information on the election uh, is returned to our office. In our poll worker training, we go through it page by page. There's a three hour recording here you can watch where we train folks specifically on how to fill out the moderator return, how to make sure to check the seals on all of our equipment, how to make certain that um, uh, when you do that, then you reseal things, that all of those seals are put back in place. The moderator and AR3 ring binder, simply a set of forms. All of those same forms are consolidated in the 2013 moderator handbook. We've just put them in a three ring binder. The tabulator. If you're interested in seeing a tabulator, we have an eight minute long video that literally goes um, from uh, turning it on and unlocking it all the way through removing ballots in the back. There are no secrets here. And certainly there is no situation where we're sharing our tabulators or program or programming or anything else with anyone anywhere. Whoops, you, you don't want to watch the whole video now, I assure you. <laughs> Sample ballots. Sample ballots are posted on the Secretary of State's website, not just for us, for every community in the state of Connecticut, going back a decade. So when, when, so the reason why we want to, oh, and my favorite, projector from CDW. That's literally the overhead projector we use when we need to train folks in our office. CDW is the computer discount warehouse, the company we purchased it from. Okay? So it, it, it's important to us because when someone, when a member of my staff is FOI'd and this is taken and this is somehow being attributed to some sort of nefarious motives, it's important that people really understand the context here. We want to address a few of the other questions that have come forth. So one question that keeps on coming forth is, why haven't a registrar simply asked for more funds? So if you serve on the RTM, when you see our budget, you don't actually see the budget we submit. You see the first selectman's budget, where they have already decided what they're going to cut from our budget. And we're happy to provide for you going from all the way in 2011 to this year, 
okay, how the town administration's process is to encourage minimal increases and to try and keep non-personnel expenses flat, uh, flat. When I worked with Sharon Vecchiola, John Creary was the town administrator. He suggested that we should, that the cost of our maintenance agreement shouldn't be more than $500 for our paper folder. And he was cutting our budget for $500. This last year, Ben Branion, and we admire these folks, but this is the process that you need to understand that happens, okay? He decided everything but personnel, because personnel increases at a faster rate, should remain flat. So our office supplies were cut by $700. Our printing and binding reports were cut by $1,400, okay? When you're in that kind of environment, and those are the signals that are being sent, it is not a situation where you're, where you're suddenly going to say, hmm, perhaps we can ask for extra special things. We are in a flat operating environment, and that is where we encourage, encourage to be. So Greenwich was singled out because no other New England towns received any funding. Well, the reality is that you're hearing from county clerks today, but in, in around the country, but in New England, elections are run at the municipal level, which is different from the rest of the country. Okay, so what happens is you have a series of part-time election officials and their ability to keep up with national opportunities is limited. So my friend, Melissa Russell, who is the Republican registrar in Bethlehem, they work six hours a week. I'm not certain she knows that there are opportunities for some of these things. And you can see that in a lot of small towns. So rather than saying, hey, it's amazing that you guys are out there looking into these, we're saying, why are you singled out? The reality is because we're putting in the time and we're looking to see what we can do to continue to up our skills. Now, I do want to address, because there were some things that came out today in this uh, treatise from the, the uh, Greenwich Patriots that was submitted, and there were a couple of pieces that really I thought some facts needed to be uh, added to this. So the first is, uh, it was stated, I just need to move some stuff around my screen here. The last email in the, sorry, the last email in the FOI response dated December 11th. Apparently, there was not a single email with the keyword CTCL between December 11th and January 19th. Well, that's because when we worked with that requester, we agreed we were giving them dates up to December 11th, and they were fine with that. So now suddenly, to say why is there nothing from December 11th to January 19th seems a little odd. Here's a copy of the correspondence where I say to the requester, we have a file that runs from May to December 11, 22 with all of the keywords. And the response back I got, thank you for the response. I'd like to see the file. And I'd like you to expand the dates for the file you already have back to 2016, which is what we did. So now suddenly for someone to say, isn't it weird when we gave exactly what was being asked doesn't seem to me like an appropriate uh, way of conveying what actually happened. We also were told, uh, or you were told today, that DiCaro admitted that his department is starved for recognition and perhaps is why his office never seemed to question the intentions. Here's the full quote. As you can tell, we are starved for recognition, and we want to leverage this, the center designation, as much as possible to build the credibility of our office and our fellow election administrators in Connecticut, with a new Secretary of State coming in who will be looking to develop best practices. And that's because we're always looking to professionalize what we do. And I go back to that PR problem slide that I show you before, okay? When you have declining trust in government, when you have complex situations, absolutely, you want to make sure that people do recognize when you are doing things right and that you are maintaining integrity. It was again stated that in August that I immediately replied to express interest, and within days, I was interviewed. 
this is simply false. I have no idea what this interview is that anyone was talking about. There's no emails related to this, et cetera. In fact, the town clerk applied for the grant in 2020, not our office. They filled out a simple application. They received $28,000. There were no strings attached. And it was actually my email to the BET that said the CTL grant was, was related to Facebook. That's never brought up. And finally, although Greenwich rece did receive the grant, for some reason this requested item was not included in the FOI response. Again, this is false. The requester was directed to the town clerk's office who made the application and received the grant. We said quite clearly, in red, in the email to the requester, the registrars of voters have never received a grant for funding prior to the 2022 grant. Prior funding was requested by the town clerk's office. They should be able to provide you with their correspondence on the matter. So if I were to use the same kind of language used here, I would be saying, gee, what else is wrong in the materials that were submitted to you? We've got some folks on the line who are specifically going to address the concept of coaching. Because again, one of the other things that has been brought forth is that we're able to get coaching from Alliance Partners. What does that mean? So we want to introduce you to a few of the individuals who have both been coached and are coaches to understand this in the context of election administration. Mary? Okay. So, um, is this going into the microphone? So, welcome Pete Duncan and Tasman Swanson. Pete Duncan was, is the county clerk from Macoupin County, Illinois. He was elected in 2010. He has worked to provide a more efficient and effective office while having the smallest number of employees in the office since 1948. He was sworn in at age 24. He is the youngest county elected official in Macoupin history and one of the youngest county officials in the history of Illinois. He was named one of the top 25 under 45 young leaders in Macoupin County in 2011 by the Macoupin Economic Development Partnership. Peter also serves on the State of Illinois Budgeting for Results Commission and his efforts led to McCoupin ranking in the top 10 counties of the Illinois Policy Institute's online transparency audit. And we also have with us Tasman Swanson, who is a civic designer uh, for the Center for Civic Design, um, which is a partner in the Alliance for Election Excellence. She recently worked with Macoupin County to assist in redesign of a communications piece. She worked to train and coach Macoupin County staff in how to perform usability testing when designing the materials. Usability testing is a tool for learning where people interacting with a design, such as a form or a sign, encounter frustration and translating what you see in here to make a here to make a better design that will eliminate those frustrations. So welcome, Pete and Tasman. All right, so if we can show them. Yes, we'll spotlight you guys, and I know you have a, uh, actually, I, uh, Tasman will be sharing her screen. I forgot that, I think, right? Okay, well, let me mm -hmm. see. So Tasman's on your left and Pete's on your right. Cool. Um, is everyone seeing my screen? It should have a blue bar that says Macoupin County, Illinois, vote by mail postcard at the top. Yes. Fabulous. Um, cool. So hello, I'm Tasman from the Center for Pacific Design and here with Pete from Macoupin County. We'll be going back and forth on this. We have rehearsed it, so uh, give us some grace as we 
<laughs> as we go through our presentation, please. Um, so we'll be covering five things, uh, project goals and how this project got started, what we mean by coaching and what that looked like, the design of the postcard, testing, and then next step and some reflections. So to start off with, how did this project come about? Uh, Pete, do you want to kick us off? You said. Yeah, so I've got a form that my voters keep making mistakes on. And then we don't have Sophie with us, but uh, Sophie, who's a staff member at CTCL, said, I know a team from the Alliance that might be able to help. And then that was me saying, hello, hi, we've got you and would love to work on this project. So our goals, we had different goals for why we wanted to work together. Uh, Pete, what did you want to do uh, on this postcard? Yeah, so uh, this postcard is a state required mailing uh, to every voter who's not on the permanent vote by mail list that we uh, started in 2020 and then got re upped in 2022. We did it in the primary, and a lot of folks were having trouble filling it out um, and also noticing that we were trying to expand it to include uh, a polling place notification as well as in person early voting. Um, so we reached out because we were trying to prevent those problems from happening in the future and hoping we could get some help. And then on my end with CCD, uh, we were super excited to coach the Macoupin County election staff on how they could run usability testing and use plain language and information design themselves. We were thinking like, yes, this is a really cool form slash postcard that we can use to teach these skills so that the Macoupin County office and their staff would be able to replicate the process not just on this one form, but for lots of future materials well after uh, me and my team went back home. So coaching, what did that actually look like? So uh, myself and two other staff members from CCD flew out to McCoupin County, Illinois, and we did a two-day coaching workshop training with Pete and two of his staff members. So um, again, our main goal was about coaching the office through usability testing. And the close second was we wanted to improve the form on the postcard. Uh, on We had a jam packed two days on Monday morning. We did a presentation about usability testing. We co-developed the moderator script. Uh, Anna, one of our staff members ran a testing session while the the Coupon County office observed, and then there was a group discussion about um, what was covered in the presentation. So this is just a picture from uh, our Monday morning together. And then we did a slow transfer uh, of control to Pete and his team. So we started off with one-on-one -on -one modeling where one member of CCD's staff would lead a session with a voter um, where they would show them the postcard, ask them, you know, hey, imagine this showed up at your house, what would you do with it? And then the Macoupin County staff member would take notes and watch the session. Then we flip the script and uh, one of the staff members from Macoupin County led the session with the voter while someone from CCD watched and was the primary note taker. And then on Tuesday, the next day, we transferred control and uh, folks from Macoubin County both led the testing session and also took notes on, uh, on what the voters were seeing, how they were doing with the postcard. And after that, we had a discussion about what did we hear from the voters? What did we learn? How can we improve the design of the form um, in order to meet the needs of the voters that we had heard from. And I'll just say that I went out actually and picked up lunch for our staff, uh, for like all of us who were part of it. And my staff were leading the conversations. And when I came back in, like my two staff members from CCD were standing at the back of the room while Pete and his two team members were like really driving the conversation and talking about, oh, I heard this voter say this, this voter had this problem. So it really was by the end of the two days, I uh, felt like from my perspective that uh, the McCoupin County staff were driving the process 
um, and making decisions informed by conversations with voters. Pete, is there anything you would want to add about the, um, the coaching two days? Yeah, um, it's the one our office had never done uh, usability testing uh, in any way, shape, or form before this. So it was uh, a great educational experience. We have um, not quite to the full extent of what we did here with the postcard, but we've done a couple uh, little mini usability tests uh, with some other things we do in the office, which has been kind of fun. And I would totally agree with Tasman. By the end of it, we were basically, and the McCoupin folks, uh, running the show in terms of not just the testing, but also let's try this based off of what we heard from voters. Um, so yeah, it was a great experience. Awesome. I'll very quickly sort of show the design and how it went through changes both before and after testing. So this was the original postcard that um, the McCoupin County staff sent out to their voters in 2022. Was it? Yes. Um, yeah, the primary in 2022. And I'll start off by saying that there were a lot of things that I loved about this postcard when it uh, showed up in my email. Um, I loved that it was a two-fold postcard, like saves paper. That's just like a really clever design. Um, so that was a great starting place from uh, the McCoupin staff. I loved also that it had both a form section and it also had information that voters really needed. And there were some things that we wanted to improve upon. There were a lot of voters who were, you know, checking the wrong box or checking all of the boxes or um, not filling out the form portion correctly. Um, and that's where CCD's work on plain language and information design came in. So we went through a couple of different um, options and we tested these different options with voters. This is the information page that told people about their voting options and we tried out a layout where there were two chunks of information, three chunks of information, and four chunks of information. And it was all the same information, just in a different order. Um, and then we also tried out on the form or oath page, uh, different layouts that again, had the same information, but voters were, it was in a different order. Um, and we put all of these different combinations in front of uh, nine different voters and ended up with a single postcard that combined the best of all of the different designs into one uh, into one piece, which was very exciting to do over just two days. And then briefly on testing, um, we had nine different people, nine different voters who tried out different iterations of the postcard that we just showed you. We did testing in two locations. One was in the McCoupin clerk's office. Uh, and then the these ones we had scheduled or the McCoupin County staff had scheduled voters to come in in advance. And then we went over to the public library and did another style of testing called intercept testing where we stopped folks as they were coming and going from the library and we were like, hey, do you have 15 minutes, half an hour to sit and chat with us? Um, and we're going to show you something and just we want to know what you think. And that can be a little bit scary to approach people and stop them as they're going about their daily lives. But it's also a great way to do really rapid um, conversations going into a public spot. Uh, and the public library staff were so welcoming um, and a lot of fun to to work with. By the end of the day, they were helping us like find library patient uh, patrons to be our staff. Um, so yeah, we had two different recruitment methods and the folks that we talked to had a wide range of experiences. One person had never voted before. Um, and some people were positive about vote by mail. Some people were negative about vote by mail. And that was really important to have that diversity of experiences and perspectives as part of the testing. And then when we talk about that controlled handover, um, on here you can see this is a chart of the nine participants that we talked to, and there's the moderator column and the note taker column, and you can see the blue and the yellow, blue is CCD, McCoupin is yellow, as handing power, I suppose, or like control back and forth over the course of the two days where it started with CCD driving as the moderator. And then we took the back seat 
um, as note takers later on uh, in the process. And uh, Pete and his staff were were really driving the car for the second half of the of the process. In terms of next steps, um, the postcard is out and like went out to voters, which is really cool. Uh, to have that rapid turnaround. We're also potentially turning this form slash postcard into a template that could be adapted to other states' uh, needs because, I again, I think it was such a clever design to have a single sheet of paper um, that could be folded in different ways that, yeah, just a really clever use of space and resources that um, the Bakupin County staff had already developed. So we want to be able to share that. And then, in terms of CCD's work within the Alliance, we're going to be replicating this coaching model uh, in future work with other Alliance CEEs, where we're giving people space to practice a new skill and then hopefully cheering on from afar over the coming months as uh, each CE, each Center of Elections Excellence continues to replicate this usability testing in their own, um, in their own work. And I've got some space for reflections, Pete. I'd love to hear more about how the experience was from you. Yeah, so um, in terms of favorite moment, there, there's probably two. Uh, one of the, the voters that we had scheduled at a time uh, was actually one of the voters who had complained and had some concerns about the uh, postcard when it initially went out. So we made sure we wanted to include her. Uh, she was definitely one of the folks that was not a fan of vote by mail. Um, so I got to lead and, and be the one to do the testing on that one. Uh, it was an enjoyable experience. Um, she had some very interesting observations that I would not have probably thought of on my own. Uh, and I think I'll make it make it better. Um, and then, the, yeah, the, the second one was just in the picture kind of showed it. Once we got to the point of taking what we found in the testing and actually applying it to the postcard and the design, uh, you know, it was... I didn't notice it until Tasman had mentioned it, but yeah, by the end of it, uh, her two staff folks had stepped back and it was just three of us. And uh, yeah, we didn't even notice that they had left because we were just that involved in what if we did this, let's try that. Um, in terms of what could have been better, um, you know, we were on a very tight timeline from the time we made the request um, to when testing came in, there was the holidays. And then we have a April 4th election here in Illinois that the postcard had to go out for. Um, and so to get it to our printer in time, uh, we had to get it done pretty quick. So the timeline probably could have been better if we, but you know, elections don't get delayed. So uh, we did the best we could. Um, in terms of what questions we talked about after we left, uh, you know, there was still a few things with the postcard even now that we've looked at and we thought if we do this postcard again, we might want to change this. Uh, we definitely want to get some insight from some voters on a couple other things with it. Um, so, so yeah, those were probably the things we talked about. Uh, I also mentioned earlier, we've already kind of done many, uh, many usability testing with some of the two other projects we've got going in the office. Um, so we found it useful. I think it's definitely something we'll, we'll continue to do. Um, in terms of additional support, you know, it would just be the, the time and the resources to be able to, to do a full one every time we would need it, which probably isn't isn't something we're going to be able to do. Uh, but yeah, even just doing a mini one has been um, incredibly helpful. And real quick, just to kind of tie a bow on it, um, you know, the design we really liked, we're really happy with, with how it turned out. But See, uh, the Center for Civic Design sent it to us. If we had decided we didn't like it at all, we could have just thrown it in the junk uh, folder of our email and sent out the old postcard. Um, we sent it to the printer we've been using for years. They did not print it for us or mail it on our behalf. We didn't send them yeah. our voter registration list for them to print it. Um, you know, there was no, this was us asking for help. They gave it. Uh, with no real requirement that we use it if it wasn't something we felt would be useful. We did find it useful, and so far, in the response we've gotten back, uh, I think voters have too. So if, if I could ask, so if we were to do usability testing like this here, and for instance on improving signage, because in Connecticut, voters have to line up by street, not by name, and it's consistently an issue. But if we were to do usability testing related to that, 
and we were, to say, to, to use a training room for it. And we wanted to invite other departments to come and learn for themselves how to build other customer-facing materials that were improved. Is there any problem with us leveraging those skills and showing them to other people here in the town hall? No problem at all from my perspective. And in fact, I think that that's such an excellent question that like really epitomizes for me why Fred, Mary, you and your staff and the Registrar of Voters in Greenwich are a center of elections excellence. Like you really embody the spirit of a rising tide lifts all boats and wanting to you know, share skills out. I'll say from CCD's perspective, we have led cross-departmental workshops before. Uh, just this past December, we were in a mid-sized county in the Midwest leading a multi-day workshop on building a language access program where there were lots of departments that took, play, that took part in it. Um, everyone from the elections department to animal control, which was a really fun, uh, you know, room to be part of. And the style of usability testing that CCD talks about really isn't unique to elections. We consider usability testing along with plain language and information design and accessible design to be core skills that can be applied to any department or person who wants to make their constituents' experiences interacting with the government better. And the final thing I'll say on that is that um, just a couple months ago in 2022, actually, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security adapted or first borrowed CCD's usability testing toolkit and adapted it for use in DHS as well as other federal government um, agencies more broadly. So we definitely think that uh, the skills that we teach and practice um, are widely applicable. So Pete, talking in, in, in general, thank, thank you, Tasman, specifically about the design, but talking in gen general, what made you want to apply to be a center for excellence and, and, and part of the alliance? Yeah, so uh, at least from what I've heard so far, I think I'm probably the office uh, here tonight that has the shortest relationship with CTCL because we, we actually didn't even know they existed until 2020. Um, but we applied for the grant just as you all did, got the grant, it was extremely helpful. Uh, since then, we've been on their email notification list. And, and like Ricky said, that, that list has provided uh, ideas that we've implemented, ideas that I just find interesting, but that we haven't actually implemented. Um, and so I thought, based off the initial email when this came out, this would be a nationwide group that was kind of offering support, figuring out ways to improve, implement some best practices. That would be an interesting uh, group to be a part of. And, and so far, I, it, it definitely is. So how would you respond to the statement, your elections are good enough? Yeah, so... You know, when I got elected in 2010 uh, to where we are now in terms of elections, it is uh, incredibly uh, more advanced uh, and I, I think much better. Um, uh, most of the voters and, and poll workers I talk to agree, uh, not all of them, but most. Uh, but, you know, in, for those of you who aren't familiar with Macoupin County, uh, we are in Illinois, but we're four hours south of Chicago, and the southern part of my county is only about a half hour away from St. Louis. So we're really almost more Missouri. Um, so we've gotten a lot of news about the Kansas City Chiefs with the, the Super Bowl last couple weeks. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes wins his second Super Bowl, his second Super Bowl MVP, uh, also is the regular season MVP, and you would think, good enough, right? Uh, the big story last week was he'd already showed up for training for next season. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the same thing, I think, with elections is, yeah, we're doing a pretty good job, but we could do better. Uh, there's no perfect election, no matter how hard you try. There's always something you can improve on. There's always something that could go better. Um, so that, that would be my answer is, yes, we might be good enough, but we could always be better. And that should be what all of government is striving to do, not just elections or any of the other offices. And that's our goal. And, and Pete, just for perspective, what was okay. your your vote turnout in the or your the way your vote broke down in the 2020 presidential election? Yes, yeah, so former President Trump won 67% of the vote in every precinct in my county. 
All right, well, guys, thank you so much. Um, it was great meeting you in person, and I, 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 we learned a lot related to usability uh, testing from your, um, uh, your presentation here and, and when I saw it, and I'm glad that others can understand the nature of what coaching is, okay, in a nonpartisan fashion of learning about best practices. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, at this point, we'd like to introduce Pam Anderson, so Pam's been, she, Pam was there right at six o'clock, so she's been with us for an hour. And Mary, if you'd, uh, sure. if you'd be so kind. Uh, so welcome, Pam. Uh, Pam uh, is a retired clerk and recorder from Jefferson County, Colorado. Uh, Pam served for eight years in that position and was president of the Colorado County Clerks Association. She began her elective service in 2003 as a municipal clerk in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. And uh, Ms. Anderson was the 2022 Republican candidate for Secretary of State in Colorado. She served as the Republican co-chair for the Clerks Association Legislative Committee for several years. She has been recognized for her expertise and support of elections best practices and voter-centric reforms, such as vote centers, mail ballot, and post-election independent audits. Thank you, Pam. So Pam, when, 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 when I heard you speak, one of the things that, that struck me was you talked about, as an election admin administrator, being of politics, but not in politics. So could you explain? Yeah I, I had, yeah. yeah, I had to chuckle a little bit on the introduction because it says I'm a retired clerk and recorder. Uh, we have term limits, so it was a forced retirement, just to be clear, for everybody for elected office in, in Colorado. But I still have, have pursued my profession as, as an election official. I still work as a local administrator and in, in contracting and supporting local election officials. and. And now after almost 20 years, what we've learned is I, I've been I've been elected three times, once as a nonpartisan, but registered Republican uh, municipal clerk, twice as, as the election official and clerk and recorder for Jefferson County, Colorado. Um, small jurisdiction for my municipal. I had a staff of including myself of three and at the at the county level, a staff of 110. Um, and in conducting elections, it's a profession, and, and there's a context of politics, certainly. I'm an affiliated Republican. I've been a Republican my entire adult life, and this will date me a little. Handed out bumper stickers for Reagan in Ventura County, California, where I was, where I was raised. But, but as an election administrator, being in that context, you're the referee. And so you're, you're really driven by process not outcome and and we do elections we we love elections in the west we vote on everything we have initiatives and candidates and all, all the things um and and being focused on that process and and really loving what i was hearing from my colleagues on on your meeting tonight was is very consistent with how i've approached the work that i do and um both as an election official, but also in, in my philanthropy and volunteer time as a volunteer board member with, with groups that, that share my values. So you are actually on the board of directors of the Center for Tech and Civic Life. And I am, I've been on the board. I was trying to remember, it was before the 2016 presidential election actually, when I went on the board, I think it was in 2015. Um, I took a brief, uh, a hiatus as a candidate for statewide office last year as the Secretary of State. I took a leave of absence from my volunteer work. I'm also on the um, Center for Election Innovation and Research. I've served on advisory committees um, for Pew, for the AC, and, and others. And I, I really uh, work on supporting best practices and tools to improve elections process for voters, but also to improve it for election administrators. Um, my experience with CTSCL started as um, an executive director for the Colorado County Clerks Association. I was president of the association as election official. 
And then after Term Limited, they were uh, one of my clients and I ran their nonprofit professional association um, seeking training and tools for our 64 counties of every political stripe. We have Republicans, mostly Republicans, Democrats, and we have unaffiliated election officials at the county level to help improve. And I was incredibly impressed with their training and tools. They're built and informed through advisory committees, committees like you heard from Ricky Hatch and focus groups of election officials that share the best ideas around the country. And they take those and their expertise and, and reshare them out and use them for free and low cost training for, for election officials. So um, sitting on the board, have you seen mm -hmm. any, um, well, how do you respond when people say that the board of directors, for instance, may have more individuals from one party or another? How does that affect the dynamic of the organization or does it? <clears throat> Well, I think having diversity of, of folks on, on any given board, like I said, I've, I'm on multiple boards. I'm also a library trustee I'm for the Jefferson County Public Library. And, and, and I think it's important to have diversity on, on that board. But my experience with CTCL, and I think Ricky um, um, from Utah described that very well, um, is that it's been focused on the process of elections and improving that process for voters. Um, one of the things we learned, not only through a global pandemic and the crisis that we, we were faced with in 2020, um, in putting on an election, given all the constraints and challenges that everybody was experiencing in multiple professions, but also what we learned from that experience was also the uh, financial constraints that thousands of, of jurisdictions are faced with. And that's not something new as our job has become more complicated. When I came in over 20 years ago, it's mostly a clerical job. But election officials now have to wear so many different hats, whether it's being an IT expert or a cybersecurity expert or a communications expert, as you, you heard described in, in um, mailings and communications with voters. How do you build a website? Um, what are the best practices in adult training and, and poll worker training? Um, how do you secure and uh, you know and evaluate technology? And so all of these things have been relatively new, meaning over the last couple of decades to the job. And I think what we've seen both in my own association in Colorado, um, but also nationally um, in a crisis, we saw a lot of those um, those needs exacerbated. And I think it's important for our profession to, to be able to convene and share. And I think that's what CTCL has done in my experience. And as a board member, I have never experienced even once any sort of political outcome desire. It's all about the process. So again, I know you have a, a, a a fairly long tenure, and you probably have some insight into the future. Um, and I know I've asked this of others too. So have you ever been asked in any of your roles for any data extracts, any voter lists, any other bulk information on the voters of any jurisdiction you represent? Or is that in any way part of a long-term plan you're aware of from the Center for Tech and Civic Life? No. And you know, Colorado, we're positioned a little bit differently. A lot of our voter database public participation is very public. It's it's very transparent. But um, no organization that I served on has asked for any information of that sort, nor would I support that. Did you have any questions, Mary? Or no? All, right. All right, well, Pam, I, I appreciate you taking the, the time to join us today, I, I'm sure the audience does as well. Um, you know, for those of you who are sort of election geeks, there's a podcast out there called um, High Turnout, Wide Margins. And uh, Pam was a featured speaker on it a couple of uh, weeks ago, and uh, I got to see that recording live. It was, it was great. Um, uh, Pam, uh, thanks again. I appreciate your time, and uh, have a great night. 
Well, thank you so much and congratulations to you and your community in exploring this. I, I, I find it very commendable. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So I think let me uh, share my screen one more time. So at this point, Mary and I would like to highlight a new program which we've created, and we've based it on best practices and similar programs put in place around the country from other centers for election excellence and other um, high-performing offices. And we call it the Election Academy. And the idea behind it is that um, uh, people will, um, anyone can join, anyone can be part of it, there's no cost associated with it. The first round of it for this year, we're going to keep it open until March 15th. And anyone can sign up at uh, GreenwichCT.gov slash Election Academy, which I'll show you again later. So we're going to have six different courses as part of it. So when you're part of this, you're going to really see and be able to dig deep into every aspect of what we do so that it's not speculation you will be able to see everything from how we clean our voter databases to how we test our equipment to how we make adjustments at our polling places. You'll get the same copies of materials that we send out to our candidates. Okay, we want, and, and we want your feedback related to that as well. So um, we have put the dates and times because we do ask everyone who signs up to be able to commit to attending all of the courses associated with it. So to run through them quickly, we'll be doing an intro to elections course in the month of April. That'll give you a tour of our office, an introduction to the election calendar and more routine functions. We'll do a voter registration procedure which shows you how we clean our voter lists. We're very proud of our process. And also review ERIC, which is a database and national consortium, which is how, for instance, we have found voters who are voting in Florida and Connecticut, okay, once Eric joined, uh, Florida joined Eric last year. You will take the polling place moderator course, which is a state-sponsored course. There's an online and there's a, uh, an in-person piece. So you will actually become a certified moderator that can be called upon. You don't have to, but you'll understand the full process. Once the legislature has established what exactly is involved in early voting, you'll be part of us creating the implementation process around it as we get feedback from people, like you heard Pete talk about, usability testing, et cetera, to see how are we going to best serve voters through that without creating a disruptive process or creating an expensive process. You'll take all of our, our training that we give poll workers. You'll see those sample checker books and those, those uh, tabulators and all of those materials themselves. We run those classes multiple times. We already have, we're long-term planners. The dates are already set in our calendar for um, course five way out into uh, November. And finally, we'll create a post-election activities course and that'll be based upon what happens after the election. In some cases, there may be a recount. In other cases, there may be a random audit. Um, usually there's one or the other. So you can exactly see how we go about counting those ballots and verifying them against the tabulator. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, and we have, a, we have some handouts also for you that has all this same information, you can go on our website right now at greenwichct.gov slash election academy. Uh, that, that address also has copies of this handout, but for those of you in the room, you'll get your own uh, color copy. And that concludes what we wanted to share with you tonight. So we thank you for coming. We thank those of you who uh, attended online, and we hope this gave you a little bit more information about how it is we do our jobs in this environment, sharing and learning best practices from around the nation.